idea it was to buy the rights for Christopher Hampton's play of Les Liaisons Dangereuses is an American woman called Eileen Mizell. And I happened to be meeting with her about a totally unrelated project. And at the end of this meeting about the project, I said to her at the time she ran a little movie studio in Hollywood called Lorimar, which was the money, I think, from Lorimar Television and, and a, a very famous personal manager called Bernie Brillstein. And I just asked her at the end of the meeting, what else are you guys looking at? And she said, uh, oh, we're going to do this film called Les Liaisons Dangereuses. Uh, hey, do you want to be in it? And I, I kind of said, me? Why, why would you? Uh, why? Uh, and at that time, they were talking to Volker Schlundorf, who had done Swan in Love and, uh, of course, was educated in France and had a great sort of knowledge of, of French literature and culture, et cetera, et cetera. But he'd felt kind of very badly burned by the reception of Swan in Love, and which we know from doing the other part of the book, Le Temps Retrouvé. And uh, then Volker sort of backed out of a meeting. I had met Stephen years before for a film by John based on the John Masters John book Masters called, book called the, the Deceivers. The Deceivers. And Stephen and I had lunch in, in London, and he came to talk to me about being in the movie, and by the time we left, I had talked him out of doing the movie <laughs> uh, at all. And then I think you came to burn this yeah. to a play I was doing in New York. Well, the, it, I mean, it's, of course, it's a, it's a long, long story because after Lorimar, <clears throat> after Lorimar um, bought the rights, it was all mixed up because, because Milos was going to do the same film. So they couldn't, they were, they were trying every director in the world, and people kept saying, well, I can't do this. Milos lives down the street, or... I mean, I guess people... And, Milos and I, is Milos, Milos Foreman. Foreman. And I guess he just won the Oscar for Mozart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so then Volker turned it down. And then Christopher. Now, Christopher says, but I don't believe him, that he'd always said I was the right person. But I don't believe him. I think him. he did always say <coughs> Anyway, after Volker turned him down, Christopher said, now can I go to Stephen? So my story began on New Year's Day when Christopher put the script through the letterbox and I read it and said, this is absolutely wonderful. Um, and then I was flown to New York, or I went to see Eileen Maisel, I remember, and said, oh dear, this is very, very good. I fell into a terrible depression because it was so good that it was going to have to be made. And the prospect of making a film is always very, very depressing. <laughs> so I went to New York and I had lunch with this man, Bernie Brillstein, who is in fact the real hero of the story. Mm -hmm. And um, what they were nervous really about was the race with Milos. And Bernie said, when can you start? Well, I was unemployed. <laughs> But I looked at my diary and said, Tuesday. 
And I guess I started work on Tuesday. Anyway, that evening, I remember being, uh, it, it, I'd flown on Concord, which I'd never done before, so I was already in a state of overexcitement. <laughs> and that night, I remember coming to see Burn This, and Christopher had said, oh, John is giving this incredible performance in Burn This. So I went to see Burn This. And then I Do you remember what you said when you came yeah. backstage? This is quite good. Um, Stephen came backstage to see this play that, that uh, I was doing on Broadway called Burn This. And the first thing he said, he kind of wandered into the dressing room, you know, hello, how are you? And then he, I could tell he was thinking about something. And then he said, so why are you actually never good in the movies? <laughs> and I did. Yes, you did. Oh, I do. And I said, well, I really, why? And he said, yes, I'm curious. And I said, well, because I don't control any of the movie. And he said, oh. Um, <laughs> and the, did you change your mind now or not? Was it a good question to ask? Perfect question. <laughs> be, be, it is a perfect question because a lot of the time in the movies, there, there are probably several elements that come into play. The, if, if you compare often the quality of theater writing to the quality of movie, movie writing in terms of just characterization, movies can at times come off as impoverished. But even if you remove that element, you know, in other words, a great part in a great play, if you remove that element, there, there are several other things that come into play. One is there is no momentum in a movie. So in other words, when you go to do a play, you have the start of the play behind you, you have the middle of the play behind you, and you have the momentum of the play behind you. So I always compare it, say, to uh, hanging on to a runaway train as opposed to pushing a boulder up a hill. And, and that's, that's a big part of it. But the other element that is also really important is many film directors, unlike Stephen, but many film directors don't know about directing a performance. They don't even know what it is. They might be interested, but they have no experience in doing it. It's like they're watching something in Swahili instead of saying, hey, listen, when you do that, be careful, blah, blah, blah. And many of them, of course, in my experience, are mostly concerned with the picture. And so, of course, it, if you come from my background, I thought it was a fantastic question, and I replied as honestly as I could. Because, of course, on stage, you control your performance. Oh, you edit it. You choose your take. You choose the pace. It's a very, very different thing to acting in a movie, especially acting in a movie where many directors even if they're interested in it, they don't understand that that's a huge part of their responsibility, is your performance. That's, that's a huge thing, and a lot of them just don't do it. And I don't even know, some are interested, I think, but, but many not. I, I wouldn't know, I only know one. You I? only know one, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I know 70. <laughs> so. Hi. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Uh, uh, you were talking about momentum, and I, I thought of the, the one-shot film that Tarkovsky did, and, um, and if you believe that in one shot, that maybe you can keep that momentum anyway. 
Well, I mean, Orson Welles did at the beginning of Touch of Evil. Is that what you mean? I meant with the, the comparison between theatre and cinema that was being between, made. You, you, it, what he means is the, the whole process, <laughs> the whole process of making a movie, which is broken up really essentially into little tiny shots, little tiny moments, little tiny elements. Could it be done? Yeah, but I don't know that in general you can do whole films that way. Well, uh, Hitchcock, Hitchcock. He, he did one. He did uh, one. And at least for a long period. The, what well, is it? There's the very rope. few. The rope. rope. Yeah. There's, there's, very, there's very few shots in rope. Yeah. It's a pretty rope. dreadful film. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's the problem. But if you want to make a dreadful film, there yeah. you are. There's the blueprint. Yeah. Thank you for the advice. What? Uh, the other question I had was, uh, I've noticed that uh, Bertolucci, he, he tends to, to um, have a lot to say about everything. And uh, when you worked with him, did he, did he direct you very much? Did he say an awful lot before you could begin? No. My experience of, of Bertolucci is uh, he... To me, he's one of the funniest people I've ever worked with. Uh, he's very, very witty. He's very quick. Um, he's a kind of life-affirming Italian somewhere inside himself. And he didn't talk to me a lot. In fact, very little. I would say about the film itself or about the role. I think he talked a lot more with Deborah because that's also more her manner of working. I'm not a big discusser of things. I like to start going and then take it from there. But uh Stephen's probably in the middle. We, we would discuss some, but Stephen... Stephen always knows when the magic hits. It, in terms of the camera placement, the actors, everything being kind of in its place. Uh, but we didn't have huge philosophical no. discussions about either film. We always no. talked about the end of Mary Riley, what we were going to do. Yeah, but that's to do with what the story should be, isn't that's it? That's right. But <coughs> with really liaison, not <coughs> so much. You really direct it with your ear. Yeah. You do it with your ear. Yeah. John Houston used to turn his back on the set. And you can always hear conviction and you can always hear the music in the voice. Yes. Uh, hi, good evening. Um, I, had a question, I have a question for both of you. Uh, because you said, John, that one of the good things about working with Stephen was that he allowed you to take responsibility as actors and rehearse on your own and all that. Um, at the same time, you said it was really good because he paid attention to the actors rather than just you know, letting you be a part of the picture which isn't really, not really emphasizing the performance. So my question is to Stephen as a director, do you prefer to just leave the actors to it, maybe have a quick, uh, a brief meeting with them and then leave them to it and then when it comes to the shooting, maybe give them some guiding lines? And to you, John, as an actor, do you prefer to um, read the script and then maybe have a quick meeting with the, um, with the director and then have rehearsals on your own and go, you know, go to the shooting? Or do you prefer to actually have the director uh, in rehearsals, in a rehearsal room with you, to give you those guiding lines so that you can grow your character from there? Thank you. Well, it, it's, it's, it's better when it comes from the actors. But of course, what has to come from the actors has to make sense and has to be part of your, you know, it can't go off over there. 
it has to be coherent and and um, <clears throat> you know you have to you have to you question it but of course stuff that comes from the actors is more um, convincing and more fun and more this and more that than somehow them doing what they're told it's the misery I, I I would agree with Stephen that it probably is better if it comes from them, but you really have to be careful there <laughs> because, and I mean, I say this also as a director, it, that depends on the actors. How, how much responsibility can they take? How much responsibility can they have outside of their little element? Um, can you trust them about writing? Can you trust them about where to put the camera? Can you trust them about the, le the choice of lens or how the camera moves? That really depends on the actor uh, or, or actress. And I don't have a preference about rehearsal. When I'm rehearsing, I'm working already. <laughs> if, if there is a good director there to say, hey, I'm going to respond to what I just saw, and this is what I just saw, I'm delighted. Uh, because obviously, I think especially in cinema, what you think you're doing may not be what you're doing. It's just that simple. Uh, so, of course, you'd rather have an eye there to say, I mean, I could cite so many examples from Liaison, but I remember a scene uh, where um, Michelle Pfeiffer's character and my character, it was a scene where he circles her many, many times, and there was a kind of counter camera movement by our, our magnificent uh, camera operator, an English man called Mike, Mike Fox, Michael Fox. Um, and Stephen kept adding another sort of twirl. And first he irritated Michelle very much with that idea, which he just kept torturing with, us with, and, you know, calling her the Hawaiian because she grew up surfing in California, <laughs> and finding other ways to irritate her. And then eventually he irritated me. And it was all to have one more twirl. And we had already done, I don't know, it was probably 14. And we kind of finally said, no, we don't. Okay. Very interesting. Stephen never went to the rushes of, of Les Liaisons Dangereuses. He, he sent me. And he sent me partially as a torture uh, because I was the one who fought with the camera operator every day all day long about every frame. <laughs> None of which I was ever right about. <laughs> and I think Stephen loved the idea of Mike Fox sitting on one side of the screening theater and me on the other. I was still, I was angry at him every day. And I would go, and every night that I would go, I'd have to get up, walk over to Mike Fox, and say, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I'm very sorry for what I said today. Um, uh, that, you're right, that wasn't a shot. Uh, okay, see you in the morning. Um, and then the next morning it would start all over. And I'll never forget that couple nights later when the Russias came in looking at that scene and thinking, you know what's funny? We needed another twirl. Uh, and that's, that's what a good director 
is for. There are things you simply can't... You know, they always say the camera doesn't lie, and I always say that's what it's for, in fact. But, you know, it's like the Paul Simon song that goes, a man sees what he wants to see and disregards the rest. A camera is like that. It sees what it wants to see. And there is a kind of mathematic or mathematics about it that personally I don't think is subjective. <laughs> I, I think you can actually look at it and go, this needed another twirl. Uh, this was maybe a second and a half too fast on the dog. That you, you think of them as really subjective, but I'm not sure how subjective they really are. Hi. First very fast question. Um, about subjectivity with the camera, don't you think when uh, the director knows exactly what he's doing, what he wants, and the effect, there's only one place to put the camera, and not such subjectivity as you told me? I think that should be obvious. I don't know. I'm not a director. Second question is, uh, for me, most best moments I remember from great movies are when uh, there are actors, characters, but they are quiet, they're not speaking, but they're so full of intensity of what's happening next or, of, of, or what's happening inside. And uh, this only happens with great directors. Why don't you work more with great directors besides Stefan Frears? Um, because you're doing many times okay movies, but uh, you're better than that. Are they afraid of you? No, I don't think it's that. I think it's... Uh... Life isn't like that. Yeah, life isn't like that. Yeah, it just isn't like that. Um, there aren't that many great directors. There aren't that many great scripts. Uh, sometimes I've worked with great directors, but not on their great films. Um, that's just the kind of luck of the draw, I think. And as far as knowing there's only one place to put the camera, yeah, that's, there, there is some truth in that. But you only know that when it happens. And the camera may be somewhere else when that happens. I, I feel it, and I think Stephen does, certainly. I mean, that's really nothing to do with the use of the subjective camera. It's just, I mean, it, it, it is, and you learn it from cameramen, really. Yeah. And they will simply look at a thing and they will know how to shoot it. Yeah. And it's quite astonishing. And, um, you know, if it isn't working, they'll go a bit close, whatever it is. And they just know how to shoot. You know, if, if it was all of you lot, they would know where to put the camera. Yeah. Instinctively. Yeah. And, and Mike Fox was, in my career, one of the, greatest examples of that because I, I remember every day of the first at least first week or two weeks of liaison uh, I would kind of say you know he'd say it's not a shot it's not a shot <laughs> and you know I would go <sighs> and I'd go and you know get on the camera and have someone do it, and I would just have to think to myself, you know what, it's not a shot. Um, and he, he said a really fascinating thing to me one day during an argument, he, which I later wrote into a film I did later, although I don't know if it's still in the film. Uh, he said to me one day, Johnny, if it's not in frame, it doesn't exist. <laughs> and, you know. that, that's what camera operators do. They just see what's in front of them. 
They don't look around the sides, they just see what's in front of them and they can see everything. Yeah. They can see when it's badly directed, when there's confusion. It, it's quite astonishing that, that, uh, that rather sort of, you know, one-eyed perspective. It's, it's absolutely, it's, it's, it's deadly. I'm sorry. This is a bit off topic, but as a philosophy student, it interests me a lot. And the whole premise of being John Markovich is that it exists a portal that if you enter it, you can uh, be inside of uh, John Markovich. Uh, I have been uh, depared with the theory of the parallel universes, which by, of any, ch if, if we think about uh, the way of the world, it exists in a parallel universe. If that is true, does not only the portal exist, like I'm using it. So, with that being said, my question is, did you, by any chance, at any point, could feel me, could feel me inside of you? Uh, I, I have the inside of me filmed. Uh, you know, now, there are medical examinations <laughs> that so if you like I'll send it to you um, I haven't had the, the pleasure of watching it myself but you actually swallow a camera and then you expel it at a later time Okay, thank you. You are welcome. Thanks. Uh,